Hello and welcome to License to Omen and My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. That must make me Kevin the Dad. Well, yes, it must. And this week for our Thanksgiving episode, I guess, we are talking about Jerry Lee Lewis. So, Dad, what do we need to know? Well, let's start off with a quotation from Memphis music critic Robert Gordon from the liner notes. If Elvis is the king of rock and roll, Jerry Lee Lewis is the dark prince. Yeah, that makes sense. Jerry Lee Lewis was born in Faraday, Louisiana on September 29th, 1935 to Elmo and Mary Lewis. Oh my God. He, his dad did not look like a Muppet. No. His family was dirt poor. So poor, Jerry Lee's parents had to mortgage their farm to buy him a piano. Ooh. He shared piano lessons with his cousins Mickey Gilly, later famous for his hit Looking for Love from the Urban Cowboy soundtrack, and Jimmy Swagger later famous for TV evangelism and prostitute scandals. The Reverend, I'm and, a sinner, I've sinned against you. And he's still alive. He's he 87. Is? Yeah. Wow. And Jerry Lee's not. That's interesting. Yep. Another cousin, Carl McVoy, showed Jerry Lee how to play the boogie-woogie styles he heard on the radio and at Haney's Big House, a black juke joint one of Jerry's uncles owned. Allegedly, by the time Jerry Lee was 14 years old, he was as good as he was ever going to get. He mixed genres and came up with his own distinctive style. Left hand played the solid boogie pattern, while the right played high filigrees. Hmm. But Mama Lewis had other ideas. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. She enrolled Jerry Lee into the Southwest Bible Institute in Waxahachie, Texas, so he could sing evangelical songs and nothing else. Waxahachie. That's a name. Mm-hmm. It's in Texas. But... He played a boogie-woogie version of My God is Real and was expelled. Ooh. And this could almost be looked at the start of a battle that Jerry Lee would fight on and off throughout his life, making sacred music as opposed to the devil's music. Jerry Lee went back home and tried to make a name for himself. Meantime, he was a failed sewing machine salesman, got married twice, and been turned down by some Nashville record labels. So he and Elmo went to Memphis, where Sun Records was. Jerry Lee went in and announced he could play piano like Chet Atkins could play guitar. Sam Phillips was out, but other in-house producer Jack Clement was intrigued. He sat Jerry Lee at a piano, brought in a guitarist and drummer. No need for a bass player. Jerry Lee provided his own bass with his left hand. Mm -hmm. And recorded some songs, including a version of Crazy Arms. Sam Phillips eventually heard it and declared, I can sell that. Mm -hmm. And he did. Sam signed Jerry Lee as a solo artist, but also as a studio musician. Oh. He was backing up Carl Perkins one day in December when, who walks in but Elvis? And, hey, there's Johnny Cash. Million Dollar Quartet. Yeah, uh huh. Jerry Lee's next single put him on the map. Whole lot of shaking going on. It sold and sold and sold. Oh, I bet. TV appearances, concerts, wild concerts. How wild, you may ask? How wild? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Now, allegedly, and I say allegedly because some say this really happened, some say it didn't. At one concert, he was told Chuck Berry would be the closing act and not Jerry Lee. Jerry Lee was so incensed, he lit his piano on fire during Great Balls of Fire and continued playing. When it was over, he yelled, I'd like to see any son of a bitch follow that. I he hope that's true. Don't know if it is. Like, Jerry Lee's changed the story sometimes. Oh, okay. And his bandmates have said, eh, maybe not. Great urban legend, though. Yeah. Pardon then, me. Great Balls of Fire, which he had problems recording due to the line, Great God Almighty, Great Balls of Fire. He got into a long discussion with Sam Phillips about the sacred and the profane. And you can find it somewhere online if you look. Oh, yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. Hence the line changed to goodness gracious, great balls of fire. And that sold and sold mm -hmm. and sold. Then came Breathless and then High School Confidential from the movie of the same name. And Jerry Lee and Van play on the flatbed truck that's a rolling record store. And that's how the movie opens. Oh. Jerry Lee's getting bigger and bigger and nothing can stop him. What Absolutely nothing. What could go wrong? Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Come to find out, he married his 13-year-old cousin, Myra Brown, mm. whose father, J.W. Brown, was the bass player in Jerry Lee's stage band. Oh, shit. 
who apparently he didn't have a problem with this. Really? Uh, Jerry Lee was 22 at the time. Ooh. And, oh, wait, he was still married to his second wife. The divorce hadn't been finalized yet. Pedophilia and bigamy, double whammy. And all of a sudden, Jerry Lee Lewis was canceled before the internet. So he was a pioneer in that sense, too. <laughs> he went from making ten grand a night to $250 a night. Ouch. But did Jerry Lee give a shit? No. No, he did not. He recorded for Sun until 1963. Then he signed with Smash Records, a subsidiary of Mercury Records. He was still playing rock and roll, but nothing was coming of it. He was about to leave the label when he was pitched the idea of recording a straight country music record. He recorded the song Another Place Another Time. It shot up to the top of the country charts. The killer was back. From 1968 to 1977, he had 17 top 10 country hits, including four number ones. But also during this time, he got married a few more times, lost both his parents and a son. Mm -hmm. And he lost two wives, had battles with the IRS, did the alcohol and pills thing, and landed in the hospital a few times. And he may have murdered one of his wives, allegedly. Well, that was um, a writer. Richard Ben Craman had made that allegation, but it was never proven. Oh, okay. The police did investigate, and no, he was not involved in, uh, in uh, one of his wives' deaths. Okay. Yeah, one of them, one of them drowned. Jerry mm -hmm. Lewis was nowhere on site. Mm -hmm. And um, the second one who... Kramer said that Jerry Lee had killed, had overdosed on drugs. Oh, okay. Okay. In 1986, he was one of the inaugural class to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's a no-brainer right there. Yeah. In 1989, he got a biopic, Great Balls of Fire, with Dennis Quaid as Jerry Lee, mm -hmm. Winona Ryder as Myra Brown, and oh, no. Alec Baldwin as Jimmy Swaggart. Oh, that works a little too well. It does. Mm. In 1998, he got a Lifetime Achievement Grammy, which I always kind of look at as like, you know, when they give out those... Honorary Oscars? Yeah. It's like, hey, we screwed up. We should have given you one for your, uh, your notable works, but we didn't. So, oops, here you go. Yeah, it's like a participation Emmy. Yeah. In 2006, he released Last Man Standing, which was an album of rock and roll duets with the likes of Jimmy Page, Bruce Springsteen, Mick, Keith, Ringo, and Neil Young, among others. It actually hit number one on the Billboard Indie Albums chart and number four on their country chart, number eight on their top rock albums chart, and number 26 on their top 200 albums chart. Hmm. And he was still touring. Mike and Sandra saw him about four years ago or so at the annual Rockabilly convention in Vegas. Oh, was he? He was old. It was like he definitely needed help getting the piano, but you put him at the piano and he just cut loose. Mm -hmm. He came out with his autobiography in 2014. In May 2022, Ethan Cohen's documentary about the man, Jerry Lee Lewis' Trouble in Mind, was released. On October 16th of this year, he finally got inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, hmm. which what took him so long, uh, 12 days before he died following a bout of pneumonia on October 28th. He was 87. And my theory is, I think Jerry Lee's spirit is doomed to walk the earth for eternity like a rock and roll Jacob Marley. Somewhere in the bayou. Well, yeah, heaven doesn't want him and hell's afraid that he'll take over. He always is a ponderous change, mm. Jerry Lee. As for me. <laughs> well, Jerry Lee Lewis was one of those guys I'd always heard of. But all I really knew was Whole Lot of Shaking and Great Balls of Fire. Mm -hmm. But I did pick up Rhino's 1984 CD, 18 Original Sun Hits. It's a solid collection. Then in 2013, the collection we're going to review, The Essential Jerry Lee Lewis, The Sun Sessions, came out. That has 40 songs. And I could not pass that collection up. The only thing wrong with it is the cover photo. There's that one tooth. Oh, I didn't notice that. Oh, once you notice it, you can never unnotice it. Do you want me to make that the thumbnail for the video then? If you want. Okay. Um, you have to Google the image to see what I mean. And that's always been one thing about Sony's Essential series. For some reason, they always manage to pick the most unflattering photos of the artists. Mm -hmm. They're black and white photos. They just slap them on there and they just don't look that great. Well, I don't know why. Maybe it started off as a vengeance thing and then it was, ah, eh, it's a tradition. 
I mean, if you get a hint, pull out, pull out some of my uh, essential collections and you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Anyway, in a perfect world, we'd review all 40 songs, but I don't think that Juliet could take it. Our listeners don't have that attention span. What? Huh? Huh? Hmm? Oh, anyway. Where were we? So I had the tough challenge of narrowing 40 songs down to 15, but I will mention the omitted songs as we go along. So first up, songs that were omitted were Crazy Arms, End of the Road, which was written by Jerry Lee himself, Good Night Irene, Hand Me Down My Walking Cane, 60 Minute Man, which leads us to... A lot of shaking going on? Nah. Uh -huh. I realized I had heard this song before in a medley that Carl Perkins did in his Carl Perkins and Friend co Friends concert with George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Ringo Starr, and Roseanne Carter Cash. That cover was fun. This one is more playful teasing, like come on over and shake it, baby, for all it's worth. What surprised me was the moment where the music goes quiet, and I kind of felt uncomfortable for a sec because the way Jerry Lee spoke was as if there was a girl in the recording studio who was stripping right in front of his piano. It's a good possibility. Made me feel like I shouldn't be listening to this. Then the music comes back in blasting with a wonderful jolt to the system, and it starts rocking again after the moment of quiet intimacy. Almost like a musical round two, if you wish. Interesting cover, but I prefer the version from Carl Perkins and Friends. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's part of a good medley. It's All right. Fun. Okay, this was first recorded by Big May Bell in March 1955. Um, it was recorded by Roy Hall in September of 1955, and Jerry Lee recorded it in February 1957. It was released as a single in April of 57, and it hit number three on Billboard's Hot 100 and number one on its R&B chart. I listened to Big Maybell's version. It's a shouting, shuffling blues number. Not bad. Definitely nudge, nudge, wink, wink with the lyrics. But Jerry Lee definitely made it his own. He altered the lyrics to the point that they could be risque or not. Mm. And he sped it up. Okay. It's just a guitar, drums, and piano. Again, Jerry Lee was his own bass player. And his asides are lascivious. Mm -hmm. We've gone from wink wink to lair lair to um bang bang. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Cuz the man was anything but subtle. Yeah. If this was all he'd ever done, he'd still be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I can see that. Next track, it'll be me. I don't want to think about Jerry Lee crawling across the floor looking for me. I'd call the cops. ESOB is a total <laughs> peeping tom in this song. The knock on the door is normal. But then crawling on the floor, peeping his head out, and climbing on a telephone pole? As I've said before in a previous episode, officer, it's this one right here. Knowing Jerry Lee's history with women, you go, yikes. And yet, there are moments where his voice is so charming, you almost forget if it wasn't for the creepiness of the lyrics. I'm so glad he never found me. I bet the girls who married him threw up in their mouth a little bit when they heard this song due to unpleasant memories. It tries to be cute, but with the context of the man's history, it never will be. <laughs> yeah, something is not quite right. Mm -hmm. If you see something crawling across the floor, or a funny face in your comic book, a rocket ship on its way to Mars, even a lump in your sugar bowl, it's Jerry Lee looking for you. Mm -hmm. And this makes every breath you take by the police sound tame in comparison. Oh, yeah. For your stalker song. The band chugs away while Jerry Lee's fingers do the walking up and down his piano, and probably other areas as well. Hmm. Next track, Lewis Boogie. Something tells me this song is ripping off Johnny Be Good, and not just for the New Orleans reference, it just sounds like Chuck Berry. Hmm. I did have to look up uh, Sacroiliac on Google, and confirm my suspicions. This is about sex, not dance, which, I mean, come on, do it till you break, it's pretty obvious. Something tells me Lewis's version of sex was a good time in his eyes, but maybe not a good time for the women. I don't even want to think about it. Also, nice how he references Elvis to say, he might call you a dog, but I'll make you shake all over. From fear, Jerry, not arousal. Out of anyone else's mouth, this would be a fun song. Go listen to Chuck Berry instead. <laughs> this was written by Jerry Lee, and great piano playing, duh. Mm -hmm. And worth, I always thought, for years, I always thought the line was, um, he was calling out Elvis for being nothing but a hound, but it's Elvis calls you nothing but a hound. And as Jerry Lee once said of the king, who does that son of a bitch think he is? Because it was an incident where Jerry Lee, drunk out of his mind, 
drives to Graceland, oh, demands no. to be let in to see Elvis. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't going to happen. Cops had to be called and Wee-oo, all that. Wee-oo. And as he's being hauled off, it was, who's that son of a bitch think he is? Yeah, El- Elvis just never impressed Jerry Lee, and I'm sure that worked the other way, too. Oh, we're going to get to that a little bit later. Oh, yes. Next track, When the Saints Go Marching In. Story time. In fourth grade, I had to learn to play the recorder. We did what was called recorder karate, where you were given a colored piece of string tied to your recorder for every song you could play with. I remember that. One of the pieces we had to learn was, Oh, When the Saints Go Marching In for Blue Belt. Way easier than Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for Red Belt, don't even get me started. Anyway, I was trying to practice it, and you played me this version, and I kept saying it was the wrong one, because it didn't sound like the one I had to learn. I had no idea at the time that people could do whatever they wanted when they covered a song, so I just assumed Jerry Lee's was entirely wrong. This song reminds me of a bit Eddie Izzard did when she talked about how only Catholics can make hallelujah sound, not sound like hallelujah. Everyone just sounds so miserable. Hallelujah. But this sounds fun. If you grew up Catholic and heard any uplifting versions of hymns, you felt cheated. I would have gone to church more if the music was this good. And I can't help it. This version is fun. Even if heaven and hell didn't want him, this is a passionate cover with some fun piano playing and shows at heart that he's a Southern boy. Great rendition. Uh, this is one of the most famous spirituals ever. Um, its origin is kind of unclear. I just did a lot of looking up and it's kind of muddy. But in the credits, is, it's listed as traditional with arrangement by Jerry Lee Lewis. Mm-hmm. And the original lyrics are apocalyptic. It's not a fun song at all. It's like everyone's screwed and going to hell. Mm-hmm. Now, Jerry Lee's take is more hopeful. And it's a perfect example of the sacred, a spiritual, meeting the profane, rock and roll, a.k.a. The Devil's Music. Mm -hmm. Jerry Lee sings about seeing his savior who saved his soul from sin and will greet Jerry Lee with an extended hand. Mm -hmm. Jerry Lee then tears it up on the piano. He sings about seeing Jesus, Paul, and Silas too. I had to look up Silas. I don't even remember Silas. Well, he and Paul got thrown in jail for preaching and they got out at midnight when an earthquake broke open the prison doors. Very convenient. Yeah. And the thing is about this song is you believe every word Jerry Lee sings. And why not? He believed them. Sure. Now, the next songs we left out, Drinkin' Wine Spodiote, which I wish we had covered, <laughs> You Bangy Stomp, You Win Again, and Mean Woman Blues, like Roy Orbison had done. Mm-hmm. Next song? Great Balls of Fire. Jerry Lee's heart, along with his loins, are on fire. <laughs> he laughed at love, but he met this one woman, and that is it. Like, she's got him restless. Not just horny restless. Restless in general. Restless until he sees her again. The type of agitation where you don't know who you are anymore because of this person. And the fire is overwhelming him more and more with each kiss. It's his most iconic song and everyone's heard it at least once. It's a fun song to dance to as a kid, even if you don't understand the lyrics. I also looked up the Family Guy version, which my friends Jaden and Cam sent me, where Seamus plays it on the church organ with all four wooden bodily appendages. And honestly, that's most likely how Jerry Lee would want it. And yet, with this one, I don't go out of my mind. Is it fun? Yeah. Do I lose every time? Nope. And other than that, I don't really know what to say. Okay. Did you look up the Family Guy one yet? No, I still haven't. All I right, still, we'll, still got to get to we'll that. We'll do it after this episode. All right. The Earthquake of Love. Mm-hmm. Or Lust. More likely the latter. Yeah, yeah. Nerve shake. Brains rattle. Too much love drives a man insane. As mentioned earlier, it was supposed to be Great God Almighty, Great Balls of Fire, but that threw Jerry Lee into spiritual turmoil. And I, I did find most of the conversation he had with Sam Phillips on YouTube. For some reason, the, the way it ends has been left off. I don't know if it just got lost or what. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a transcript that you can find, and I've read it a lot of times, and it's one of those things where like, it's one thing to read it, But listening to it, you can really hear how conflicted Jerry Lee was about his vocation. Mm -hmm. And you compared him to... People that you hear talking to themselves on the subway station in Boston. Yes. Yeah. I can kind of see that. But at least in this case, he had an audience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the song itself sold a million copies in 10 days, which was unheard of at the time. Mm. And why did it sell so much? Because it's one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever. Just Jerry Lee, a drummer... 
And for some reason, a bass player. Mm. Don't know why. It could have just been Jerry Lee and the drummer. Maybe they wanted a little extra something for this. Because I always thought that it was just, just two men playing on this. Just mm -hmm. Jerry Lee on the piano and his drummer. And then in the credits in the booklet, they list a bass player, which is kind of superfluous. Anyway, amazingly, and I never knew this, this song is only one minute and 52 seconds long. Oh. And I never knew it was that short. And it packs so much into so little time. And I know I already said this, but it's one of the greatest songs ever. And that just re re bears repeating. Yeah. Now, the next song that got left off, Milkshake Mademoiselle, which is kind of eh, not his greatest effort, but not bad. Which leads us into... Breathless. Oh, boy, we're back in creepy territory. I do not want this man to squeeze me at all. And when he whispers the word breathless in my ear, it's like a cursed ASMR video. Like, he's right up in my headphones and I can't get away. Is a ASMR, is that I Like Trains? No. Oh. That's um, ASDF movie. Oh, okay. ASMR is when people talk really close into your headphones and it's really soft and whispery. Like he's a close talker. Yeah, people used to go to fall asleep sometimes. Oh, okay. I also write scripts for it. And Jerry Lee's gonna be wherever I go? No way! Please stay as far away from me as possible and stop blowing in my ear! I already had one guy blow on my neck and I hated it. Look, the yeah, man's a leech. Uh, I know who you are and you shall rename Nameless, you yeah. son of a bitch. Oh yeah, Dad's not the only one who wants to kill you for that. Anyway, uh, this man, Jerry Lee, is a leech. Once he clings on, he won't let go and uh, might kill you in the process. But then I watched the live version and that man is a performer. He knows how to tease an audience to make them go wild. His hands were a blur on the piano and he slammed the keys and it was mind blowing. Now I know why people say the devil is a charmer because he's having fun while doing it and you can't help but smile along. I think I saw him, if I saw him perform live, I'd be all Google eyes and that's what scares me because for three minutes my principles went out the door <laughs> as I saw that man become sex on a stick in front of a whole audience. Oh my God, someone needs to give me a good shake. <laughs> Make it stop. Make it stop. It'll never stop. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was alarmed. I was alarmed at myself. It's okay. Yeah. You're going to be all right. Yeah. This made it to number seven in 1958, and it's pretty simple. Jerry Lee's girl leaves him uh, mm -hmm. breathless. Uh, that's all there is to it. But that is the moment that makes the whole song. And I do have another version by the band X, and they do a good job. But both these versions are tame next to the live version that you saw of Jerry Lee doing mm -hmm. it on the American Bandstand Live. Mm -hmm. No lip syncing at all. Bandstand was known for, for acts coming out and just lip syncing along to their latest hit. Mm -hmm. But he does it live. Mm -hmm. And everyone loses it. Yeah, you want to know what made Jerry Lee great, which you just found out? Watch this video on YouTube. That piano is not being played so much as it's being slammed on, violated. Yeah, yeah. Jerry Lee, that feels like an appropriate adjective. Yeah, you watch that performance and it will leave you, uh, well, you know. Yeah, next track. Good rockin' tonight. Oh, Jerry will do you harm, much harm. And if you go in that barn, he'll either break you from a wild night that will break the bed and exhaust you because he's too much of a wild thing, or you'll be dead. Maybe both. This is also the first time that Jerry's vibrato has sounded weird, and I can't describe exactly what he's doing to make it sound like that, but I know it's not natural, and it makes him sound childish and pubescent with all the raging hormones that come with the territory. I want to go rock with someone else. No, Jerry, it won't be all right. It was never all right with you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was written and recorded by Roy Brown in 1947. And it was remade in 1954 by Elvis. It was covered again in 1984 by the Honey Drippers, who were Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and friends. And that, that went to number 25 on the Billboard Hot 100. Hmm. And it pretty much sticks to like the way it was originally as a, as a jump blues. I, I've got the CD if you, wanna, if you ever want to hear it. It's only five songs. Hmm. Um, there are lots of other versions out there, too. And then... There's this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just listen to Jerry Lee's hand, right hand flying up and down that piano. I mean, holy shit. Yep. 
He also works in the verse from a whole lot of shaking going on. And his voice, like when you say vibrato, do you mean like when he sings I'm a mighty, mighty man and it's like really high? Uh, I don't know. I, I forgot what part it was. Okay. Because there are times when he sings, he sings the phrase I'm a mighty, mighty man. First he sings it in his regular voice. Mm -hmm. Then he sings it in a much higher register. That's his falsetto. That's not yeah. the same as vibrato. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, he sings it in that falsetto, which is the last thing you'd ever expect to hear coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And then the last time he sings it, he sings it in his regular voice again, but he really emphasizes it. And that this was the song that made me realize he had such a versatile voice and he knew what to do with it. And on this song, he's having so much fun with it. It's infectious. Next track. And then the Not next yet. two songs that we left off, Jailhouse Rock, which is going to sound blasphemous, but I think he does a better job than Elvis ever did. When we get to Elvis, we'll probably talk about both versions. And then um, Jambalaya. I mean, I like Jambalaya on there. Oh, next track, Big Legged Mama. One. Big Legged Woman, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I like my version better. He's either talking about a woman who's very tall and leggy, or someone with thunder thighs that can get wrapped around his head till he suffocates. Ooh, the scissors. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Anyway. The head scissors. This song is just pure lust, and I bet it was banned everywhere. The cherry lyric would have made me do a spit take if I had something to drink while I was listening to it. But my favorite part is that short piano solo where Jerry Lee bangs out his lust on the keys. All we would need is the piano and we'd instantly know what this song is about. I'm surprised he's not more frantic, but maybe he's hoping the restraint and teasing will drive her to a point where she's begging for her clothes to be torn off. Great song, but uh, is there a cover by somebody else I can listen to? Well, this was written and recorded by Jimmy Williams in 1951. Mm -hmm. And I found another version by Big Joe Williams that came out on Smithsonian's record label in 1968, and it's a really slowed down version. He does it as a blues, and it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. This is easily one of the dirtiest songs ever recorded. I mean, it's just the way Jerry Lee sings it. Mm -hmm. He takes it from nudge, nudge, wink, wink territory to, into no one under 18 admitted. Mm. Just absolutely filthy. Was and the thing is, it's like, it's like, there's no swearing in the song. Nope. There's definitely like, I guess, double entendres, I it's suppose. It's not explicit dirty talk. No, it's not, but it's just the way he puts it across. I remember once there was actually a discussion about this song on WEEI, which is a sports radio station. On Wine Radio? No, no. This was the midday show. I don't know how the guys got on this topic, but they were talking about dirty songs. And for some reason, I guess someone called in and mentioned this. And the guys were like, really? And then they listened to it. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah. Now, was this band? Do we know? Well, let's continue. Oh, okay. Anyway, so Jerry Lee, he laughs in this song. He does Roy Orbison's growl. Oh. And in some spots, he sounds like he's going to... Uh, lose control right then and there and after all he's put us and his piano through at the end he defiantly declares it's a hit mm -hmm. oh not in this reality my friend mm -hmm. no i don't know if it got banned so much as there was no way this was going to be released as a single no there no just no. wasn't mm -hmm. and this ends disc one disc two hello hello baby hello uh-oh, someone's having phone sex. Jerry is sweet-talking his girl over the phone, and he knows what he's doing. I think the stammer is supposed to be teasing the girl or trying to make her laugh to loosen up the mood. Something tells me he's yelling these words over the phone while she's blushing and shushing him so her mama don't hear. Definitely a lust and playfulness afoot here. But if he called me, I'd hang up. Especially with the Roy Orbison growl that sounds like Roy from the Dark Dimension. <laughs> This was written by Jerry Lee. Mm. And I've always thought of this as like a polite version of Big Legged Woman. Mm. Almost sort of like a sequel. Like you said, I mean, it's on the phone. Every time he calls her, he never finds her home. 
But, well, she had to be home this time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, just the way Jerry Lee sings the word hello, and he sings it a lot mm -hmm. in this song. It's worth it. I mean, he just plays with that word. And, again, I don't think people are aware of how versatile his voice is. Mm -hmm. Just listening to this song makes you aware of just how in command he was. Yeah. Okay, yeah. next... Yeah. Next two songs that we are not covering, Fools Like Me and Put Me Down. We are covering High School Confidential. The Grease vibes are off the charts here. Do you really want Jerry Lee running around in high school? No. It reminds <laughs> me of the dance they had at the gym in the movie. I give Jerry Lee credit here to a point because it sounds like he's taking a high school wallflower out to show her a good time. And Jerry here uses the youthful quality of his voice to not sound like a lech but to have fun, which is what high school dances are supposed to be. Fun! And I don't think he ever forgot, but his way of translating that into the adult world definitely clashed with a lot of people. It's pretty innocent as far as Jerry's songs go, and it does sound like a good time. I'd play this at a dance school, or at a school dance, or a 50s dance, 100%. Uh, just uh, don't tell the PTA who the singer is, because then there's going to be a school board meeting. The children! What <laughs> about the, the children? children? Oh my god. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. Mm. Anyway, this was co-written by Jerry Lee and Ron Hargrave. And the thing is, it's like a lot of places only give, give Ron Hargrave credit for it, but there are other sources where they both get credit for it. Take your pick. Anyway, this was his fourth top 40 hit, and he would only have two more. A cover of Ray Charles' hit, What I Say, in 1961, and a cover of Me and Bobby McGee in 1972. This song is from the movie of the same name, starring Russ Tamblin, oh. John Drew Barrymore, yes, Drew's father, mm -hmm. and Mamie Van Dorn and her missiles. I don't know who that is. Uh, she was in the long line of um, the next Marilyn Monroe, oh. and there were a lot of them. Hmm. I mean, and as for her missiles, if you Google a picture of high school confidential, you'll see what I mean. Hmm poke your eye out with one of those things. <laughs> anyway, Jerry Lee and his band opened the movie by singing the song on the flatbed truck. Lyrically, there's not a lot to it. Everybody's bopping at the high school hop and JL wants to take his girl there. The song, the song starts out slow in the first verse, but as soon as it hits the chorus, we've gone from zero to 60 in an instant. Mm. And once again, Jerry Lee's voice and piano make the song. Mm -hmm. Next track, Wild Child, Real Wild Child. Definitely the most autobiographical, don't you think? Oh, yeah. At least he's aware of it in this song, but he's happy with that label because being wild allows him to have fun with his music. And this made me realize, concept time, I want someone to write a version of The Devil Went Down to Georgia called The Devil Went Down to Louisiana, where the devil challenges Jerry Lee to a piano playing contest. Oh, we know who's going to win that one. That'd be fun. Now, what strikes me about this is... How the music is fast in tempo, and Jerry Lee is full of energy, but for a song about a wild child, the lyrics aren't really outrageous. You just believe he's wild because of the energy being put out there. Which makes me wonder, if Jerry Lee could have gotten away with writing fully uncensored lyrics, no holds barred with permission to use colorful language, would he have? And would that detract from his performing at all for shock value. Interesting hypothetical to pose. I don't know. He didn't write this song, but um, like with other songs, I'm sure he could add his own lyrics. A song where you believe what he says. Yeah. Now, the first version I ever heard of this song mm -hmm. was by Iggy Pop. No shit! On his 1986 David Bowie produced album, Blah Blah Blah. Huh. And it's a good version, but... Then I heard Jerry Lee's and realized, oh, this is how it's supposed to sound. Gotcha. And it makes you realize Iggy's version does not live up to the title, which is confounding because Iggy Pop is like... Punk. He's so... He, he's Punk so... Incarnate. Out there. Uh -huh. He was, but this was like 1986. He was older, you know. Well, he's not old, old. No, but, you know, if you're going to sing I'm a Real Wild Child... Like you said, the lyrics aren't much. It's how the singer puts it across. Do you think early Iggy could have done it better? Oh, he would have torn it up. Yeah. Oh, easily. 
And it writes on maybe right wrong time. Yeah, I mean, this is the egg for God's sake. And you know what I'm going to say? And you may not like this. Mm-hmm. Bowie's fault for the production. That's <laughs> all I'm going to say. No, I think some people would agree with you on that one. Um, I've, I've got it on my Nude and Rude Iggy collection if you ever want to hear it. We'll do Iggy one day. Yeah, we will. Uh, um, this is Jerry's real theme song. And his piano playing is amazing on this one. As per usual. Yep, and of course he also manages to quote a whole lot of shaking on here too. Mm-hmm. And the song that we skipped over, Break Up. And now Big Blonde Baby. First note I wrote in all caps, you stay away from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> now what I want to know is, have you ever played this song for mom? No, I have not. You, know, you should try and see what she thinks at one point. Because based on what Uncle Joey told me about what you used to tell him when you met Mom, it would add up. Do I want to know what I used to say? Because I can't remember. I just, I met this gorgeous girl and she's blonde and she's beautiful and that's all I know. Oh, okay. If there's any more, you didn't tell me. Anyway. Thank you, Uncle Joey. I think the only reason I like this song is because it makes me think of you and Mom and the Jerry Lee of it all fades away, making it a cute ode to tall, gorgeous blonde women. A song that's pretty fluffy and tame for Jerry's material, but he's not phoning it in, and it's a good time. And okay, I'll be the first to admit, the way the song starts off, it almost sounds like a kiddie song, the way that piano has that. I can't picture Jerry writing songs for Wait, 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 wait a minute. It has that sound to it. Then once Jerry Lee opens its mouth, and it's children, it's time to leave the room. Yep. Yep. I love how you said its mouth, implying Jerry Lee is some sort of, like, swamp creature or something. Oh, sorry, his mouth. (laughs) As Daffy Duck would say, huh, pronoun trouble. (laughs) And anyway, how many songs have the phrase Jumpin' Jehoshaphat in them? Yeah. All this in a minute and 41 seconds. Ugh, great stuff. Yeah, I was surprised at the length of it. I I looked up at the the clock on the uh, CD player and I was like, oh, that's it? Yep. Oh, wow, okay. Okay, songs that we skipped, Lovin' Up a Storm, Hillbilly Fever, Let's talk about us, Old Black Joe, and what I say. It wouldn't happen with me. It's not going to happen with you either. Did Elvis ever get to respond to this? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Jerry is saying all those other guys would bore you if you ended up with them. But if you ended up with me, no way. And to that I say, you wouldn't be bored, but you wouldn't be happy either. Now, as for whether Elvis was boring, Rita Moreno said when she slept with him to get back at Marlon Brando for cheating on her, that Elvis was pretty boring. She said that he was very sweet and very kind, but not much else. She said that he was too country for her, compared to Brando, according to her. But considering how Brando treated her, I bet those feelings are a little bit mixed. Anyways. Well, Brando was in The Wild One. Anyway, I wonder how many fans heard this song and uh, took it a little too seriously. Because Jerry is basically declaring open season for the groupies and fangirls that follow him. And I ever wonder, I wonder if he ever realized just how big a can of worms he opened with this song. It's a cautionary tale. Be careful when you meet your idols, especially Jerry Lee. Yeah. Mm. I've always found this song hilarious. You may love Elvis, Jackie Wilson, Fabian... Even Ricky Nelson. In Ricky's case, you'll never get to squeeze him because he's a traveling man, to quote Ricky's song. Like the airport, give it the airport, take it away. Exactly, yep. Mm-hmm. You may love these guys, but you'll get tired of them pretty quick. But not with Jerry Lee. Mm-hmm. You might not be around long enough to get tired. You'll get tired Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Sorry. Because mm-hmm. he was married seven times. <laughs> Billy Sherrill produced this, which explains the background singers, which kind of seem... Out of place. I don't know who Billy Sherrill is, so. Uh, Billy Sherrill would go on to create the country and western subgenre, Country Politan, which um, he made um, Tammy Wynette and George Jones huge oh, stars. Okay. Which Country Politan was, he would use these lush string arrangements and he would use background vocals provided by choirs. Oh, I think I've heard some of those then. Oh, yeah, you have. Mm-hmm. You, you have. And. Um, there are people who think, yeah, that was such the greatest thing. And other people who thought, oh, my God, this is like Muzak. What the heck? Where's my songs about working class struggles? Damn it. Yeah. 
Why do we have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir behind me? Okay, songs that we skipped. Cold, Cold Heart, Waiting for a Train, One Minute Past Eternity, Invitation to Your Party, and I Can't Seem to Say Goodbye. And with these songs, he's moving away from rock and roll and mm -hmm. starting to get a little more into country, which mm -hmm. leads us to... Will the Circle Be Unbroken? Okay, can you just tell me quickly who wrote this song? Okay, this was written in 1907 by Ada Robertson. Okay. And it was re we reworked into the more familiar version by A.P. Carter and released by the Carter family in 1935. The Carter family would spawn off June and eventually Carlene. Okay, because when you go on Google, it doesn't say the songwriters until the very bottom. On the top, it says, by Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash. Maybe a version that they sang. Sure. What? Holy shit, this song is sad. Jerry Lee is watching The Undertaker come and collect his mama's body. And wow, I would never expect a song like this from him. And he sings it so sincerely. And he sounds sad. It really affected me because for once he's not showing off or going hog wild. He is utterly emotionally sober and it is jarring. Jarring, but beautiful to listen to with its sincerity. But I don't know if I could listen to it all the time because... Wow, do you get depressed when Jerry is sad. Because when he's down in the dumps, he's got nothing left. This must be played at a lot of funerals down south. Oh, I'm sure Holy it is. Holy shit. Uh, the song's theme is life continues even after death. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the song follows the singer, uh, Jerry Lee, as he sees a hearse roll up to take away his mother. And then he tells the undertaker to drive slow, follows the hearse to the ceremony, and cries when his mother is laid in her grave and then he has to go back home and life just goes on mm -hmm. and yeah you notice that his version is respectful will the circle be unbroken is considered country music's anthem and he treats it as such now what does the phrase mean will the circle be unbroken is he referring to like the cycle of generational trauma or something or what um <sighs> like when the wagons i kind of think of like the circle of life kind of thing oh okay so sense. it's it's uh, it's never unbroken because life is going to go on, and you kind of think maybe after experiencing someone dying that nah, you know things are just never going to be the same, and then eventually you realize that yeah things are things are going to go on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no no flashy filigrees on the piano; it's just solid playing, mm -hmm. and the song points to the direction in which he take his comeback. Uh, he'd make his comeback as a country music artist. Mm -hmm. Final song, Set in the Woods on Fire. And with this title, we are back to our regularly scheduled program. I'm kind of sad it's not about literal arson, though. That'd be an interesting subject matter for a song. They're talking about how they're going to set the dance floor on fire and also set each other ablaze with lust. But for Jerry, this is remarkably restrained with no playfulness. Almost like he's going through the motions and trying to talk himself into it, so I don't buy it. Ending on the Will the Circle Be Unbroken would have been more of an emotional gut punch and would have stayed with me. But with this song, it's like, wow, that's it? Seriously? What, are you out of your mind? No. Jeez. I have different opinions. All right, this is, this is a Hank Williams song. Oh, and okay. I probably should have had you listen to his version first. Um... There are probably people out there who are going to disagree with me, but I think Jerry Lee was Hank Williams' greatest interpreter. Sorry, Hank Jr. <laughs> and Hank the Third, And because there are five Hank Williams songs on this collection, and this is the best one. It's just Jerry Lee and the piano. Nothing else necessary. He also did a band version of this song, but this is the only version you need. And the thing with this version is it did not get released until 1989. Oh, wow. So I think this was probably an outtake. And if it is, it's a hell of an outtake. And now the thing is, like, when Hank Williams sings the song, he sings the lines, I'll look swell, but you'll look sweller. I'll gas up my hot rod stoker and you'll be broke, but I'll be broker. Jerry Lee, being Jerry Lee, sings, you'll look swell, but I'll look sweller. Of course. You'll gas up my hot rod stoker. Like Jerry Lee would have to pay for gas. <laughs> and I'll be broke, but you'll be broker. And that just summarizes the man. Yep. He doesn't care who you are. He will make sure he comes out on top. And where Hank figuratively sings about setting the woods on fire, 
you just know that Jerry Lee did it for real. Oh, yeah. And you're going to think I am nuts. Okay. This is my favorite song on the whole collection. Oh, interesting pick. Thank you. And as mentioned earlier, the essential Jerry Lee Lewis, The Sun Sessions, has 40 tracks. And if you really love this music, I'd recommend picking up this collection. If, if you really, really love it and you want every single thing he ever recorded for Sun, invest in Bear Family's 18 CD, Whoa. 623 track import Jerry Lee Lewis at Sun Records. Only $339.45. They're a German record company. Oh, okay. And it is staggering because I think the last, I think the last set that they put out which they thought was complete was eight discs mm -hmm. but no they apparently they did a lot more digging and this took years and years and years to put together but they managed to find every single thing he ever recorded which, a lot of it is like outtakes and you okay. know hey here's take 32 of great balls of fire that so kind of thing you wouldn't want that then if it's mostly like outtakes and stuff i am good with the 40 tracks All right. and i highly recommend this collection highly but if 40 is too much, Rhino's 18, 18 track collection is still available out there. And you can't go wrong with that either. Overall, I think it's safe to say that Jerry Lee isn't my favorite 50s rocker. I guess this is one case where I can't separate the art from the artist. Not because some of his songs are autobiographical, but just because as a human being he freaks me out too much. And when he alludes to his lechery and debauchery with some of the songs, it's unsettling. If I found about all that after the fact, my listening experience might have been different, but I can't unsee it now. Still, if you're a fan of 50s rock, give him a listen because, let's face it, he was one of the biggest influencing artists of the time, and if you want to be an expert in rock history, you should know who he is. But in terms of what I listen to his stuff all the time, hard pass. I feel too uncomfortable. Big influence on Elton John. What ah, can I say? And I sense. consider him one of the four greatest piano players from the first era of rock and roll. The others would be Little Richard, Little Richard, mm -hmm. Fats Domino, and Chuck Berry's piano player, Johnny Johnson. Maybe listen to those guys instead. You gotta listen to Jerry Lee, too. So we've done, let's see, from, from Sun Records, we've done... Carl. Carl. Jerry. Jerry Lee. And we did some Roy. Did some That's Roy. where he started out. We, yep. we, still got a, we still got two big guys left to go. Elvis and so, Johnny. But we'll get there. Someday. When we get there. All right, as always, thank you for listening to Liz and Stolman and my dad listens to this. Please like, comment, and subscribe and all that jazz because remember, the more you interact with the video, the more reviews we get on YouTube. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. And if you're friends with my dad, tell him what episode you want to listen to and he can send it right to your inbox. And as always, I'm going to plug the Ko-Fi. If you particularly enjoyed an episode, please leave a little donation in the Ko-Fi that you can find in my link tree. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We will be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Uh, Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Yes, some words of advice to you rockers out there. And I wish I could remember who said this, but I just can't. Whatever you've done, Jerry Lee Lewis did it better.